Hello, and thank you for joining us for Public Health in Action, where we discuss various public health issues facing Stanley County. I'm Dennis Joyner. I'm the health director for the Stanley County Health Department. And recently, the county commissioners have passed a new animal control ordinance for Stanley County. And uh, we're going to be spending a little time today discussing that ordinance and what the different provisions are in that particular ordinance. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the county commissioners, the local board of health, the public at large, as well as the animal control staff for a lot of work that went into putting this uh, ordinance in place. Uh, many, many meetings and a lot of revisions uh, went into place and um, a lot of work went on. So I, would, I do want to thank the folks for that. Um, this will go into effect on July 3rd, 2013. And so it's important that the public be aware of the different aspects of the ordinance. And I'm pleased today to have with me uh, Dean Lambert, who's the supervisor for the animal control program. And we'll be covering those those aspects in a minute. So thanks for joining me, Dean, for Thank you. The, the, the program. Before we jump into the ordinance itself, uh, what are some of the key roles that the animal control program plays in Stanley County? A major role is uh, to help ensure the safety and well-being of the public and of the animals, uh, making sure that uh, animals are up to date on their rabies vaccinations in a timely manner and just the general health and well-being of the animals. So it really covers a broad gamut too. Absolutely. And I do want to point out to the general public that there's several things that govern animal control in any county in North Carolina and one are local ordinances but there are also state requirements and state laws. Uh, most of those relate to uh, rabies control and uh, cruelty related kinds of concerns. Uh, so those are going to be in place and enforced by animal control regardless of whether or not there's a an animal control ordinance in that particular county or not. Uh, one of the new requirements in the new ordinance is um, um, a term called active restraint of dogs on property Correct. in uh, areas that are under three acres. Mm -hmm. Could uh, you define and give some examples of what active restraint actually is for those situations? Active restraint is considered uh, tethering is allowed. Has to be with a eight foot minimum length tether with a swivel on both ends to restrain the animal to the property. Uh, a kennel backyard fence is also allowed. Uh, underground fencing is allowed, and uh, a leash is considered active restraint, uh, either on the property or off the property, of course. Uh, that's one of the major differences. Uh, as of now, with the old ordinance, uh, restraint was simply the animal on the property. They didn't have to be confined in any way. So if you know the public gets the mindset of confinement now with a new ordinance, it will, you know, it'll help them better understand. Yeah, that's that's actually a good way of looking at it, confining the animal, because uh, uh, we often get calls and complaints with animals that are on the person's property, but there's nothing physically keeping that dog that on the property. And so correct. the risk there is that you're going to have an increased number of dogs that mm -hmm. are going to run at large. So this ordinance, particularly for uh, properties that are under three acres, Correct. It's required that they be confined mm -hmm. through some physical means. You mentioned underground fencing, which is allowed. I would, would like to point out that uh, we obviously are referring to working underground fencing this because a lot of times people let the batteries go dead and uh, that does not serve then as an right. active restraint for that dog uh, on that particular property. Now, this aspect got a lot of discussion when we were going through the public hearings about um, larger properties mm -hmm. and the fact that we are in a rural county and a lot of 
folks who have large pieces of property would like to be able to allow their animal to right. uh, roam on their properties mm -hmm. somewhat. So this was a bit of a compromise. Could you talk a little bit about what's required for those particular properties over three acres and over? Right. Three acres and over, the animals are still required to be on the property, but uh, no physical restraint is required unless there becomes an issue. Uh, a lot of the farmers have uh, dogs that uh, they use for stock protection or herding animals. And uh, like I said, you know, they're, they're allowable to be loose on the property until an issue arises. Uh, they show up at the neighbor's house aggressive or start becoming a nuisance. And then at that point, uh, the provision is in the ordinance that even though it is allowed for them to be unrestrained, if issues arise, they can be required to be physically restrained the same as the other animals are. Okay, very good. So that uh, it doesn't remove the responsibility of the owner to make sure that dog stays on their property. That is correct. Yeah. We mentioned tethering, uh, which was uh, is always a, a somewhat of a hot, a hot topic to some yes. extent. Uh, a lot of places, particularly municipalities, um, have... Uh, pushed uh, against tethering, and uh, I think for a lot of, of good reasons, at least from a public health standpoint, um, uh, people aren't sure how long that tether, and when we say tether, we're talking cable? Cable or chain. Ropes aren't normally uh, conducive to that because, you know, the dogs chew through. Uh, chain is normally best, uh, the trolley system for Cables are good. Uh, normally, if a cable itself is used for a restraint, uh, you have the tendency for them to kink. And once they kink, they, they weaken, and eventually they'll become an issue. Uh, we see a lot of dogs now that are tethered uh, when they come into the shelter, picked up uh, a stray or whatever. They'll have a section anywhere from 12 inches to 3 foot of cable still dangling there where They've, they've twisted and it, it just weakens and breaks. But uh, normally a, a chain is best of suitable size, of course. It doesn't mean a 300-pound log chain on a chihuahua, but at the same time, you know, it has to be substantial enough to sustain the, the size and everything of the animal. Right. And uh, as it relates to tethering, too, one of the downsides uh, is, is the fact that it, it can still pose a risk, as I mentioned earlier, uh, because someone coming onto that property, don't, they don't realize how right. long that chain is. So uh, if the dog may be aggressive, it still could get access to a, a child or, true. or what have you. The other thing is it leaves that dog sort of out there in the open for other animals that may be coming. It, in a way, it sort of tracks it uh, or traps it, so to speak. Right. And so uh, not to mention that it can have some impact on their nature in general That's as true. they're pulling against the tether. So I think it's probably safe to say that we uh, would not prefer tethering, but uh, the ordinance does, it does allow it. Does that. allow it. Yeah. Um, another area in the ordinance speaks to licensure of dogs and this is not necessarily new, but what, what all does, the, does that entail? Uh, every dog over the age of four months in the county is required to have a county tax tag, for lack of a better term. Uh, it's a licensure fee that's paid at animal control, or when your taxes are declared, there's a little block at the bottom. It's not the easiest to see, and it's easy to overlook, of course, but uh, it asks for the number of dogs you own. If you simply put the number in, the uh, tax is assessed on your tax bill each year, and the uh, tax assessor's office will mail your dog tags to you at a cost of $6 per dog. Uh, if you have three dogs at the beginning of the year, uh, sell a dog, a dog dies, whatever the case might be, and you replace a dog, you're required to get a new tag for the new dog. They're not transferable. 
six dollars each if you happen to lose one simply come by animal control and uh, we'll issue you a new tag for six dollars the uh the interesting thing since i've been the health director is i'm amazed a lot of folks don't they're not aware of a, that's of, true of, a, of a, this county dog tag and part of the benefit of this is that it's to help in a small way uh, support some of the efforts that the county is putting forth in right. running animal control. Um, the old ordinance did not have uh, any real guidance or standards for uh, housing and sheltering of animals. Uh, what are some of the requirements now for housing and sheltering animals? Uh, a lot of the a lot of the new requirements were for the care and keep of the animal. Uh, in the past, we call uh, common sense tells you you don't put a don't tie a dog or put a dog lot in the middle of a field with no trees around it. We have some pretty hot days around, and uh, one of the requirements is some type of shade, a tree or a tarpaulin on top as a as a minimum. Uh, make sure they have fresh water be fed every 24 hours of, uh, and that's actually uh, a state statute that animals are fed a, uh, a good quality food at least once every 24 hours and uh, they have a steady supply of water. Uh, people say, well, they turn the water over. There are ways that you can, uh, you know, anchor the bucket so the dog doesn't turn it over, you know, best efforts. Uh, another requirement now that we had uh, trouble with in the past is, uh, feces in lots or urine in lots or where the animals are confined, uh, we were limited on. Uh, it had to be pretty extreme and you just about had to prosecute under animal cruelty in order to be able to do anything because there were no guidelines. Now if uh, you know it's excessive, they can be required to remove it and uh, if they choose not to or to ignore the suggestions, you know, the animals can be seized for their protection. Uh, those are two of the biggest. Uh, some of the uh, some of the other aspects are in the past it really didn't confine, uh, determine or define what a doghouse was, and we give some guidance as far as a doghouse is a structure with three sides and a door that's large enough for the animal to get in, but not too large. So in the winter time, the heat can be maintained inside the uh, inside the house with clean bedding being provided and changed out and that's that's a huge one because people think that the little airline crates or a house or tying one under a deck is shelter and uh, even though it does provide some type of protection it's just not the the best for the animal right I think that's um, um, one of the things many people take for granted but there are others who need a little more standard right. in terms of what uh, what proper shelter actually That's is. Uh, you mentioned something that made me think about uh, you know sort of how animal control operates. Uh, the, the question or concern about well can't keep the the the, the water bowl uh, clean or filled. Right. And I know during some of the public hearings there was discussion about you know. Uh, they didn't really think it was good for us, you know, roaming around to make sure that leaves weren't in uh, water buckets or water bowls. And we, we do need to point out that animal control is not, I mean, it's a complaint driven That's uh, correct. operation. I mean, we're not roaming around the county looking to make sure that uh, the water is perfectly clean. Uh, we realize that, you know, nature is nature. And, uh, uh, this is more to protect the animal in true. situations that become really in some mm -hmm. ways obsess, uh, uh, more uh, uh, problematic. So, right. uh, I just wanted to, to point that out to folks that um, um, it's to serve as a guide and an educational tool as right. well as not just an enforcement tool. And unfortunately, you know, people, people love their animals, but they, they kind of take the the lower end of the spectrum as far as importance goes, you know, in day-to-day -day life, you know, they go out and uh, 
go to work, they come home in the afternoons, they have a billion things to do. They go outside and toss a little food to the dog and walk away. I mean, you know, you spend a little time, make sure that the, you know, the water's fresh, make sure you feed the animal. It goes a long way. And that routine, you know, kind of sets in, and then it, once the mindset's there, it becomes a lot easier. Right. And uh, I think the dog appreciates it even more. Absolutely. As well. Um, the new ordinance also uh, addresses an area called inherently dangerous exotic animals. Um, this actually would go into effect. Uh, there's a there's a six month um, sort of transition period right. for this. But what animals are covered under this part of the uh, the ordinance? Uh. It deals a lot with uh, the larger animals, uh, bears, uh, wolves, or any non-domestic canine species, uh, imported cats that aren't considered a domestic cat. Uh, the reason this was looked at fairly strongly uh, as far as we knew, there wasn't a problem in the county, but uh, there are no accepted rabies vaccinations for wild animals. And the wolf being a canine species, a mammal of course, they can contract rabies along with bears and any of the, the felines, uh, cats. So uh, it it was something that had not been addressed in the past, so it wasn't really preventable. This helped to be able to control it in the future and address it if there is an issue now. The other part is uh, spiders, arachnids, uh, scorpions, those types of things that aren't native uh, won't be allowed because they're not from the county. Uh, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission uh, regulates the poisonous snakes, so we didn't really have to deal with those because they take care of it. But uh, that, was, that was the biggest issue, just to have groundwork in effect in order to deal with the situation if it is there. And I think the take home message too may be the fact that it's viewed as inherently dangerous. Correct. And these are, these are animals that, uh, you know, it, or wild by or nature. Wild by nature, and they're not predictable. They become very troublesome and require a certain amount of control right. that has to take place. We don't have the capacity or right. tec technical ability to uh, respond in situations where you've got uh, uh, an escaped chimpanzee that's on the loose uh, and I know that sounds kind of strange but um, some counties uh, have uh, you know you see these issues that do pop up where people want to have their exotic animal right. and there are some inherent risks associated with that for the county overall danger wise uh, being being one of the big ones you did one, one of the things we do need to point out is that reptiles non-venomous reptiles that are um, and constrictors right. are uh, allowed, allowed under this under this ordinance, right. as well as um, so that addresses like the iguanas and uh, water the, dragons, the ball python right. is still allowed under right. this uh, ordinance. Also, birds, uh, parakeets, and parrots, and those things are not considered uh, inherently dangerous animals under this uh, ordinance as right. well. So. I don't want folks to think that all of a sudden any animal they get at a pet shop is uh, is going to be excluded. Right. That, that's not necessarily the case. Um, in the same vein, that the ordinance kind of establishes some more stringent, uh, dangerous, and potentially dangerous dog requirements. Right. What's included in that section of the ordinance? Uh, we kind of. Uh we kind of elaborated on the general statute uh, 
from the state on the dangerous and potentially dangerous animals. Uh, state requires certain guidelines, uh, which include uh, the declaration of the dog, of course, if, uh, if it bites someone and uh, disfiguring injuries, uh, breaks bones or kills another animal off property. Those are the things that spark the uh, looking at that particular animal for that declaration. Uh, we also require in the new ordinance that the animal be confined inside a specially built 10 by 10 kennel as a minimum. If they want to go bigger, that's fine. Uh, has to be constructed so the animal cannot dig out or climb out. Has to be locked at all times that the animal is inside has to have signage that lets the public know that a dangerous animal is on the property. Animal has to be microchipped and the homeowner would have to have liability insurance. I think it's in the amount of $100,000 uh, because the animal has had the issue in the past. Anytime the animal is outside the lock kennel, it has to be muzzled and on a non-retractive leash and controlled by a competent person. And when that competent person comes into play, uh, while a 15-year-old or 16-year-old would probably be competent, uh, you also have to take into, uh, into the equation the, the size of the the child that might have the dog out or whatever and uh, make sure that they're able to control the dog. That's the main thing about it. So uh, it's pretty pretty stringent. Uh, it's a, a serious issue though so that's why the you know the guidelines are a little more stringent. Yeah and this gets back to one of the key elements for the role that animal control plays is right. uh, from a public health standpoint is protecting the public and dangerous uh, dogs in particular are, are key concerns of ours and we want to try to prevent that as much as we can from uh, escalating into injuries of, right. of people and uh, and other dogs for that yep. matter. Um, one of the things that, that people often um, I think get confused and this is I know a kind of a um, a gray area perhaps for animal control is uh, people may call and say well, well my neighbor's dog seems very aggressive it's always barking it's in a fenced area but it's always it's just it's a big dog and either they're afraid of the size of the dog the fact that it seems rambunctious right. and barks a lot and growls um, or if it's on a person's property, their business, for right. example, if they're using it as a guard dog. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still allowable for that person to have that, that dog on mm -hmm. that property. And while it uh, may provoke some, um, some anxiety, uh, it is still, it's still allowable Absolutely. as long as it's controlled. That's true. So it's, uh, uh, there's some, we can't prevent people from, from their personal property right. as it relates to, to that. And even though in their mind, not to interrupt you, but even though in their mind that dog may be dangerous because of its actions, it's not a dangerous dog. Right. By definition. By definition. Right. Right. Uh, conditions under which animal control should be notified. Uh, one of the one the questions that came up uh, had a lot of discussion about the issue of keeping stray animals right. and um, we made a lot of uh, sort of compromises there mm -hmm. in some respect. I think some of the public felt that we didn't want uh, the public to keep stray animals because um, um, of the way it was worded and, right. and, and that's not really the, the point that we were trying to drive home, there's, there's sort of, could you talk a little bit about the importance of uh, things to be thinking about of keeping a stray animal? Because the ordinance does allow. Right. Uh, yeah, it started out being more 
more stringent as far as the requirements. It ended up being that we asked that if a person has a stray animal on their property that they, of course, if they won't pick up, they call, but if they simply have one and they want to try to keep that animal and find its original owner, uh, they're, they're allowed to do so. We ask that they call in with a description of the animal. Uh, normally, animal control is the first line. If someone loses a dog, they call animal control. Uh, they naturally assume that animal control has either picked the dog up or someone has brought the dog in, which is a logical way of thinking. Uh, when the public keep the animals, uh, it kind of lessens to some degree the uh, the availability of information to relay back to the public. Uh, so by calling us and giving us that description, we can maybe let a caller know that calls in and says, I have lost a dog. Well, there's been one found here that matches that description. Try to put those two people together. The issue you run into with stray animals is uh, you have no idea what the dog may have been exposed to at any given time. Uh, it may have had an owner and simply got loose, or it may be a animal that has simply roamed the neighborhood and never has had a owner per se, so never had vaccinations against rabies. Uh, it's, you know, it's a liability issue from one standpoint. Uh, the kids get around it. Uh, it's just, you know, a cause for concern because you don't have any idea what the, uh, the previous history of the animal is. All right. One of the provisions in the ordinance, too, for keeping stray animals, too, relates to, you know, after 120 hours, right. you know, we, we are going to expect that person essentially becomes kind of the custodian of that animal right. and would need to maintain the aspects of this ordinance, such right. as keeping the animal under control, mm -hmm. making sure it's properly watered and, and sheltered so that, uh, at least for that period of time, the, uh, the animal is being taken care of. Right. Because, I mean, there's no question, it does provide some assistance for us because it clearly does. the animal is not having to be in the shelter, Correct. which you know, is not an ideal place to have a, 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 an animal. Uh, it, we're not having to feed it maintain it, take care of it. So from that standpoint, it's positive. From a public health standpoint, as you mentioned, you know, we don't know the rabies status. And, no, and, and so we don't know, or the behavioral status. Right. So there are some inherent risks associated and there may be an owner who's looking to find Absolutely. their dog. And if we can help them do that through getting a little information uh, we want to try to do it. So right. I, I hope that that piece is not overly alarming to the public now that we've made some of the changes there. Um, but there was some rationale as to why uh, that that piece was even in there. Absolutely. Um, one other key area is the hold time for dogs and cats has been extended yes. uh, from 72 hours to 120 hours under most circumstances. Right. Uh, why? Why is this uh, extension there? Well, the extending of the hours was to give the public a longer period of time to possibly look for their animal, to possibly find their animal, be reunited with, or simply to uh, provide that animal with a little more exposure to the public before the uh, stray status runs out uh, for adoptability. The biggest was for the owner to be able to reunite with a lost pet. Yeah. And I know that was, uh, I've noticed some other counties across North Carolina have gone to extending that time frame right. as well. So that five day period um, from the time they come into the shelter, I think for many in the county is viewed as a, as a welcome because Absolutely. unfortunately uh, the, 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 the feeling and the public is that, and, and the reality was in some cases, um, unfortunately we do have to euthanize we a do. lot of animals. And so that initial 72 hours became a, uh, 
I think, a short period of time for some to mm -hmm. uh, to to be able to be comfortable with. And not that you're ever comfortable with that right. any time frame, but we do have limited space and limited ability. So it's all the more reason to give a little more time, I guess, to uh, uh, like the Stanley County Humane Society who pulls a lot of animals Absolutely. from our shelter to be able to uh, have access. But it will put at certain times of the year, it's probably going to put a little more pressure on our shelter capacity. It will, but you know, for the for the whole picture, it'll be it'll be a welcome addition. Okay. One of the other aspects in the ordinance is um, addressing interventions for cats, and cats are kind of. Uh, uh, they're hard to, hard to control, hard to maintain in some respects, unless it's an inside cat. Um, what are some of the, um, those enforcement interventions that are included? Uh, like you said, cats are one of those things that uh, are kind of hard to deal with sometimes. Uh, the new ordinance does put in place a nuisance uh, guideline that says uh, an animal that is cat that is off property uh, damaging property, whether it's sleeping on uh, uh, someone's boat or in the flower beds tearing up things or scratching a vehicle. Uh, if uh, the cat is caught and impounded three times, it can be declared a public nuisance. If the owner of the cat does not restrain the cat inside an enclosure or something to prevent it from happening and the cat is impounded again, it can be, uh, it can be seized through uh, court proceedings and the owner not allowed to get the cat back. So it gives, you know, it gives some guidelines, it gives some, uh, some avenues to help deal with some of the issues. Which right now we really don't have. We don't have any, yeah. that's true. One of the things to point out too is that the ordinance also, ordinance also reinforces the fact that we don't routinely uh, go out and, and, and trap or get stray cats. I mean, we will assist people to the extent that we can right. uh, by loaning traps mm -hmm. to, to, to catch cats, but we're not typically going to be out picking up stray, That's true. stray cats just because that would probably take all of our, all of your staff's time. Uh, that's true. All the resources. Yeah. The um, one of the other big pieces of this ordinance, and maybe it's not saving the uh, uh, this to the very end, but a civil penalty system. The ordinance that we currently have did not have any kind of provisions for civil penalties, and and this one does. So, mm -hmm. and I know it's kind of complicated or complex in some respects, but could you sort of touch on the highlights of the civil penalty aspect? Uh, we repeatedly have, uh, you know, issues with, uh, just say, simply restraint. Uh, we go to a person's house, uh, yeah, I let my dog loose, you know, turn him out to use a bathroom, where was he, you know, whatever. Uh, Civil penalty can be instituted. Uh, the fee, uh, the fee for stray animals. I'll just use it for an example. I think the first time uh, an owned animal is off property is a fifty-dollar civil penalty. If it occurs again, I think it climbs to seventy-five dollars. The third time to a hundred dollars, and court proceedings. In the past. Uh, something as simple as a, a rabies vaccination. Uh, we give the folks 72 hours to provide the information back. In some cases, we're waiting two and three months. We end up having to take them to court just to be able to get them to provide that information back. During the whole time, you have an animal that's running loose or uh, in the county that's unvaccinated. So uh, it, gives, it gives ways to uh, make the public better understand the severity of not having an animal vaccinated and those types of things so that they will 
hopefully become more responsible and understand that there are repercussions if they don't, you know, comply with the ordinance itself. Uh, I'm sure folks won't be happy in some aspects, but there again, it's uh, it's something that's been needed to give a little bit of uh, uh, more ability, I guess, in order uh, to provide that safety that's that's essentially a requirement from our department. And I know that uh, in the past, uh, this is an issue that's often come up that uh, we would, or your staff would issue a violation and the owner would immediately wonder, well, okay, what's this going to cost me? Absolutely. And uh, when we say basically this is a slap on the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, it's discounted. Points, yeah, it's yeah, sort of discounted. So it hopefully it's, it's not necessarily to be overly punishing, but if right. we can provoke some more responsible behavior in either mm -hmm. controlling the animal, keeping right. it on the property, getting it vaccinated, getting its tags, uh, doing the things that the ordinance says that it needs to do, right. um, I think it'll be a positive Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, People can access the ordinance, uh, obviously, by contacting the Animal Control Program. Are there ways that they can find uh, out about it? It's actually online at uh, Stanley County, on the Stanley County and the Health Department website. You can access it at uh, www.stanleycountync.gov or drop by the shelter, answer any questions. They you know, the public may have or feel free to call at any time. Yeah. Where is the, speaking of the shelter, mm -hmm. where is the animal shelter located? That's Some it. people may not know. Yeah, absolutely. It's at 1037 Coble Avenue in the city of Albemarle, down below where the old prison camp used to be at the end of the road to the left. Open hours are 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday and 10 a.m. to 12 noon on Saturdays unless there's a holiday, of course, and uh, we always have a close sign up if we are closed, just let the public know, but uh, those are the normal routine working hours. Very good. Well, I, I wanted to close by, by saying, and I appreciate your time, and uh, right. this is, I know it's rather lengthy, and there's more discussion we could have with this particular ordinance, because there's a lot of details Absolutely. to it. But um, in terms of sort of a take, some take home messages uh, to the animal owners, uh, do you have any key ones that you would uh, encourage them to, to do to be responsible owners? Really and truly, uh, make sure your animal's vaccinated for the safety of the animal and for the public. Uh, make sure you have your county tax tag and display both those on the collar. Uh, that's an identification tool where if your animal is picked up stray, the public as well as ourselves can run the numbers on the rabies tag or the county tag, find out who the owner is and maybe reunite you back with your animal. Uh, make sure that if you're under three acres of uh, property to restrain the animal to the property in some form and just be you know, a common responsible pet owner and you'll never hear from us. I mean, that's, that's the biggest. Right. And I think that's kind of the ironic thing is that uh, because it's complaint driven, if you're a responsible pet owner, I think sometimes people that may get the most concerned about some of the provisions in the ordinance right. uh, are the ones that probably will never hear from us that's or exactly never see right. from us because uh, they're doing the things that right. they need to do. That's and, exactly right. Uh, that's what we want to happen here in the county. So again, I appreciate your time and uh, until we have our next uh, program, I appreciate all of you joining us and hopefully you've learned a little bit more about the, uh, the new Stanley County Animal Control Ordinance that goes into effect July the 3rd, 2013. Thanks for joining us.